It's impossible to miss hit these wedges. They're that easy. Wedges are designed by almost big, all big brands with their tour staff. I mean, one of the major brands announced new wedges last week, and it's it's not just tour inspired, it's tour driven. Well, if you don't have the short game of a tour player, you don't need that wedge. You can't handle that wedge. Folks, in 1879, Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. It's kind of important for society that we had this light bulb because you can read at night, you can watch TV at night, and you can watch YouTube, where you're watching this video right now at night because of the light bulb. But what if I told you over 140 years later, something more than important than the light bulb came along for your golf game and it also involved Edison. Yes, folks, I'm talking about Edison 2.0 golf wedges. You're in for a very special treat today. I've got the inventor of the Edison wedges on, Terry Kaler, and we're gonna discuss why these wedges are gonna help 99% of golfers out there. Because let's face it, folks, you can't hit blades, right? So why are you hitting bladed wedges meant for Jordan Spieth and those masters of the game? You hit it high on the club face. The ball pops up, comes off short. You, you miss the shot all the time, short side, horrible. You're not good. You need to get better. These wedges can help. Bold ideas, light bulb, better golf shots. That light bulb, folks, is the Thomas Edison influence. I've already removed the upper layer. I, I didn't want you to see me struggle on camera. I want to keep the illusion that I am just some kind of golf superman. This is open. I'm taking out the 59 degree wedge. Terry sent me three wedges, so I would have a gap wedge at 49 degrees, 54 degree sandwich, which is a 53 turned up to 54, and the 59 degree lob wedge. I looked at it already. It is beautiful. As beautiful a wedge as I've ever seen. These are other wedges. This is also a good looking wedge. It's not as good looking as this wedge. Good looking, better looking. So what we clearly have here is the best looking wedge on the market with this very interesting, almost Shrixon V-Sole design, which Terry Kaler has patented. So don't try to steal it. But basically, you have a sole that looks like a standard wedge sole. A lot of times we have these wedge soles and now it's all about bounce. So let's get this fatter sole, this easier sole to hit. And it doesn't look good. Somehow, I believe Terry's gonna tell us that this wedge with this little, with this special sole is the best of both worlds. High bounce and low bounce in one wedge. Versatility, folks. And here's the interesting part. It's forged five times. Why five times? Because four times isn't enough and six times is too many. We've got basically the shaft that I look for. I know in the, the Vokies I was playing that I have the S400 shaft. I told Terry I like it a little heavy in the shaft. This is the KBS Tour 120S shaft with the midsize grip. I have bare size hands. I'm a real man. I need midsize. I also wanted all three wedges the same length as my nine iron, which is 35.75 inches. That's a little bit of a Bryson DeChambeau effect. We'll also discuss the center of gravity on these wedges. It's raised higher. You're gonna be able to see that once I unwrap it. And also the special grooves, which give you freakish spin, folks, as per the website, and as per I will be testing shortly. I've got two more wedges in here. Let's test them out on a grass driving range and in a chipping area. Folks, I've got Terry Kaler on. He's a master and legend of the wedge game. Terry, thanks for coming on this episode of Big Boy Pants Golf, YouTube's hottest golf channel. Well, I'm excited about being here. I always love talking about wedges and what we do to be different from all the others on the market.
talk us through your background. You've got so many years of experience. Reed Lockhart, Eidolon, Hogan TK Wedges. You've been there. You've done it all. How has your experience in the past with Wedges led to Edison and now the Edison 2.0s? My background in golf started in 1980. It feels like, you know, ages ago. Most of my life has been spent. Uh, and I actually got into the business through advertising and marketing and began tinkering around with golf clubs as I had the opportunity to spend hours back in the back end of Ray Cook putters and Joe Powell golf and Odie Crispin putters. And I was always the kid that took my toys apart to see how they worked and sat at my dad's elbow while we took apart our fishing reels and shotguns and rifles and reloaded ammunition. I mean, I've always been intrigued by the way things work. And I literally do not remember life before golf. I grew up in a great golf family with good instruction. And so when I got in the marketing business and began to engage with some of these smaller challenger brands, I was drawn to the back end. I wanted to see how those persimmon woods were made. I wanted to see how those putters went together. And so in the in the mid 80s, I designed my first putter and that kind of took me off in that tangent. I actually designed putters for a company called Merrick Golf and and I ended up designing putters for Ben Hogan in the early 90s and kind of got a battlefield promotion to take over the marketing. This was after the company had moved to Virginia. And that experience really gave me kind of the the idea of starting my own golf company. But in, in the meantime, and this last week at the Open at Troon was really important to me because my brother and I made a trip to Scotland in 1990. And I, had a, I hadn't really dabbled in wedges. I was focused on putters at the time. And I uh, man, the tight turf over there was just tearing me up with my sand wedge and, you know, hitting those pitch shots. We were in Octoloni's golf shop off the 18th green at, at uh, St. Andrews. And I had this idea that just came to me and I saw a grinding wheel there and I uh, ran back to my hotel, got my wedge with their permission, used their grinding wheel and, and created the first crude iteration of what we call the Kaler Soul. And it worked just beautifully with the high bounce on the leading edge and the low bounce on the trailing edge. And so that sole became kind of the, the foundation of the of the Reed Lockhart Company, which I started in the mid-90s after leaving Hogan. And it just works so darn well. I just keep, you know, fiddling with it and tweaking. And, um, you know, it's been improved through the, as you mentioned, the Eidolon wedges into the line, the score wedge line, and that evolved into Ben Hogan. And um, when I ended the Ben Hogan uh, run, I kind of took a powder for a while and started writing my blog as the wedge guy on golfwrx.com. And people started writing in, when are you going to do wedges? I loved your idolons. I loved your scores. And so that's kind of where Edison came from is the idea of creating a wedge company with, with no boundaries. I mean, we can do exactly what we want in wedges. And that's what Edison is really all about. What's interesting to me is you actually use the term VSOL first, and now Shrixon uses VSOL on its regular irons. Well, you know, the when I first did the patent, <clears throat> which I was, this sole was patented in early 90s, and it was patented as the dual bounce sole, but I kind of let that name become owned by Autolon because it was just a trademark. And so then when I created Score, I created the trademark V sole to, de, to, de, to define that sole design. Well, as that morphed into Ben Hogan, the V sole tra trademark transferred to Ben Hogan. Um, still my golf club, my design, my patent, but those are just names. And so when we started Edison, I knew I was going to build wedges on this sole design because it's the best ever. And uh, and I started, you know, we just said, well, let's just call it the Kaler sole. That's what it is. So, um, and I'm very flattered, you know, Srixon has, has uh, and some other companies have kind of deviled around in it, but I've been working on the sole design for 35 years. I mean, I probably know this combination of bounces better than anybody because it's mine. I was very flattered a few years ago, a couple of years ago, there were some pictures published of Tiger Woods wedges and they have a very similar grind to the, to the Kaler sole on them. And it was funny because I had people say, oh, you're just grinding your wedges like Tiger Woods. I said, well, he was 13 when I followed my patent, so I don't think so. <laughs> Most amateurs will shy away from playing blades, but when they go to the wedge, they're playing blades. That baffles me. Uh, I'm, and because nobody's really done anything in the wedge category, remotely close to what we've seen in drivers and fairways and irons and putters. I mean, everything in, in our industry, technology is the key. I mean, we're trying to let golfers get away with their marginal shots. I mean, if you lay the sod on it or hit it in the eyebrows or fan the face open or 
hit it in the hosel. No club design fixes those things. What we in the design business can do is give you better performance as your shots drift away from that one perfect sweet spot. And nobody's really ever done this in wedges. And I, I think the reason for that primarily is because wedges are designed by almost big, all big brands with their tour staff. I mean, one of the major brands announced new wedges last week, and it's it's not just tour inspired, it's tour driven. Well, if you don't have the short game of a tour player, you don't need that wedge. You can't handle that wedge. And you look at, you know, kind of what drives me is I look at tour players wedges. I've had the privilege of working with a lot of tour players. And you see a, a penny sized wear spot centered on about the third group with a tour player wedge. But if I go into a bag room and I look at, I'm, I'm a bag room snoop. I like looking at what golfers have in their bags, trying to figure out why they chose that. But you look at their wedges and there's a silver dollar size wear pattern. It's centered up around the fifth or sixth groove, probably a little more toward the toe. Because recreational golfers playing fluffier fairways, they're hitting more shots out of the rough and they don't know how to trap the ball low in the face like a tour player. And the tour player wedge is optimized for impact on the third groove. That's what Bob Bokey and Roger Cleveland, and, and the, they have to do that because that's where their players, you know, hit their wedges. And the rest of us, you know, our best shots are three grooves higher than that. And we lo- lose 12 to 15% of the efficiency of the golf club on what we consider a perfect shot. And as you drift away from that spot, you're going to have a tremendous fall off and smash factor, which is where your ballooning ball flight and your short distance comes from. And so I just said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to forget the tour pro. They go, they have a lot of people taking care of them. I'm going to go focus on that five to 20 handicapper that just would like a gap for it to go 95 yards nearly every time or 110 yards, whatever your number is. If you hit it a little on the toe or a little high in the face or a little low in the face, it needs to go that far. And that's really what drives the Edison wedge design is getting a lot more mass high in the golf club so that we give you a more consistent launch and distance and spin. Well, you've got the higher center of gravity, which I tested out yesterday. And folks, it makes a huge difference. You're going to feel it immediately. It, it's just a better wedge for most players, including myself. What I found interesting is, and this is from your potentially your tinkering in the past, you've got the gear effect on, for example, drivers. You hit it on the toe, the, the driver will make the, want, the, the ball want to go back to, towards the, the left. You hit it on the heel, the gear effect of the driver will make the ball go out, go out to the right. Tell us about the gear effect on the wedge with the higher center of gravity. Well, you, as you mentioned, you know, we look at gear effect in our driver and fairways as kind of a right left thing. And gear effect is a just a solid principle of golf club design and it's what happened. But in wedges, what happens if you hit the ball low in the face, you have most of the weight above the, the ball, the point of impact. And that creates lower ball flight and higher spin. Just like in drivers, they're putting all the weight on the bottom to give you high launch and low spin. That's the holy grail of distance. Well, all the weight in a conventional wedge is on the bottom. And that's why tour players have learned to hit that shot down on the second, third, fourth groove so that they have more mass above impact and brings ball flight down and spin rates up. But when you're hitting it up in the middle of the face, you now have essentially what's going on in a driver. Most of that mass is below the point of impact. So therefore, the ball wants to go high with minimal spin, which is the opposite of what you're looking for in a good wedge shot. You want penetrating flight with lots of spin. Where people really see this gear effect on this golf club is in those 20 to 50-yard pitch shots where you don't have the club head speed to get spin. That golf club head is going to have to help give you the spin because you don't have club head speed. I mean, you think about if if... Scotty Scheffler and you and I are all sitting there with the same 30-yard shot. We're going to all have about the same club head speed. We only want it to go 30 yards. You can't do that with a variety of club head speeds, right? You know, the club's going to be moving this fast to make the ball go 30 yards. And my goal is bring the ball flight down, spin rate up on that shot. And Scotty Scheffler probably can spin it better than we can from 30 yards. But, um, you know, that's where we see most of our people that's where they're most amazed is what the spin is like on those intermediate pitch shots. These wedges, because of the gear effect, they spin the ball way too much for tour player. I mean, you watch these guys, they have high club head speed. They know how to pinch the ball and spin it like crazy. And they don't want more spin from their wedge shots. If anything, they'd like to have a little less. Uh, Ben Crenshaw told me one time one of the best 
little tidbits I've ever collected in my life when we were going to machined grooves and square grooves. And Ben told me, Terry, I don't want the wedge to spin the ball. I'll spin the ball. You know, recreational golfers can't relate to that. And we watch these tour players hit every kind of wedge shot imaginable because they know how to do that. And they don't want their wedges to change or it'll interrupt that learning curve. Do you think we'll get to the point like pros have now gone to dropping the three and three iron out of their bag, the four iron out of the bag? They've actually gone for more forgiveness on certain on certain clubs, on certain shots. Do you think we'll ever get to the point where they want the Kaler wedge in that fact because it's almost an easier wedge for them to hit as well? Well, <clears throat> that's interesting, you know, and we have some very good players from teaching pros that love our wedges. They're not, you know, when we talk about tour players, we're talking about 200 golfers out of 30 million, 50 million in the world that really are good enough to consistently make a living at the games. You're talking, you know, the ultra cream of the crop. But the challenge of to build the kind of forgiveness into wedges that we built into Edison, you're going to get more spin. It just goes with the territory. So it would be challenging to figure out how to give you that forgiveness of those high face shots without giving you extra spin. And the tour player doesn't want extra spin. I mean, here's an interesting little tidbit for you. Scotty Shepard, you know, he's a world leader right now. He's playing bulky SM8s. Now, he's not playing four-year-old wedges. He's playing brand new SM8s. But, man, they give him new ones all the time with fresh grooves. But even the little bitty change from the 8 to the 9 and 9 to 10 was too much interruption for Scotty Shuffler. So when you think about that, that here's the world beater, he's playing a four-year-old, five-year-old wedge design because it does exactly what he knows it's going to do. And he wants no surprises in the wedge game. And I've always told people, it's like if I handed Scotty Scheffler a wedge and said, hey, hit that, hit that shot, and he wants to hit it 40 feet on a certain trajectory and spin, and it goes 45 feet with more spin and lower trajectory, he's going to hand it back, oh, I can't do this that didn't do what I expected it to do. And my wedge game is all about no surprises. Whereas the rest of us, we kind of love to be surprised every once in a while with a wedge shot that grabs the green and doesn't drop in the front bunker when we feel it high in the face. So it's really what we have is very different. And, you know, your mark, your comment about blades and, and wedges and golfers, you know, they just gravitate to Bokies or Cleveland's or Callaway's. That's all that's on the rack, except for a few I call them one trick ponies that have a big giant soul for soft bunkers, but nobody's really said, how can I make a wedge more forgiving and accurate and versatile? That's the other side of, you know, where the soul design comes from is the versatility. It's interesting. You bring up Scotty Scheffler because in his three and four iron, he's got the Shrixon ZU eight fives, which are super forgiving while the rest of his irons are the, the Tiger Woods, uh, you know, uh, tailor-made irons, super blades. So even on certain levels, he's looking for extra forgiveness. There could be a way in the future where these pros are thinking, hey, I'm going to give these Edisons out and there is some benefit. Maybe I go with a lower spinning ball. It could very, you know, and there, that's something. And it takes a lot of money to go chase the tour. You've got to have somebody out there with them every week. I mean, these guys can feel things in a golf club you can barely measure. And you got to grind soles and grind soles. And, you know, we're... You know, one of the challenges, I mean, if like if you go and look at the open last week and the open is traditionally very firm, fast turf, but they had drenching rains. These guys all went in and got different wedges. I mean, they can do that. They have tour vans following them around, trailers following around. They can get whatever they want. The rest of us, we buy a set of wedges. We make a six, seven, eight hundred dollar investment and we're going to play a variety of courses and a variety of seasons and see a variety of lives over the next two to three years. And those wedges need to work for us everywhere. So we need versatility to go from the tight line of the ferry to the kind of fluffy fairway to the rough, to the firm bunker, the soft bunker. We need our wedges to handle as wide a variety of shots as possible, whereas the tour player gets to go to the van and get something different if conditions change. And that's really what the what the Kaler Soul Design was all about is, how can I give you a soul that really never met a lie it didn't like? Terry, tell us about smash factor with wedges we only focus on smash factor with drivers but it also has a huge role with the wedge well smash factor is what i mean very simply it is the relationship of club head speed to ball speed so on a driver 
you know, these guys you'll see about a 1.5. They'll get 125 mile an hour club head speed, 175 mile an hour ball speed because drivers are hot. They're designed for smash factor. But you get into wedges and you also have a smash factor. And on a conventional wedge, about the best you can do is 1.18 to 1.2, which means the ball speed is 18 to 20% faster than club head speed. But on a conventional tour design wedge, that happens on the third or fourth groove. If you move to the fifth or sixth groove, that smash factor drops about 15%. So that shot's got to come up short. I mean, that didn't get the energy. And if you go up higher in the face, because all these wedges are so thin up there, that smash factor can drop down to 95, 98, which means that 100-yard gap wedge shot just came up 15 yards short and it plugged in the front bunker. And so what I look at in wedges is how can I somewhat equalize that smash factor and so what we did is we optimized the wedge up at about the fifth or sixth groove, and you get about a 1.2 smash factor. When you go down to the third groove on that perfectly nipped shot, you still get a 1.18. But if you go up to the seventh or eighth groove, you're hanging up there at 1.09, 1.10, which means it carried that bunker and left you 20 feet short of the hole instead of, you know, 20 yards short of the hole. In our testing, this wedge, if you plot, a one inch circle around the face and impact all around that circle. The typical tour design wedge will throw a 50 to 55 foot pattern at 90 yards. Our wedge throws a 21 foot pattern at 90 yards. So that's your worst shots are going to come up 25, 30 feet closer to the hole. And that's what golf is all about is consistency, you know, getting, getting predictable results. And that's really what the wedge is all about. And, and for that forgiveness smash factor equalization, which is what forgiveness is, it's different in a wedge than it is in a six iron. And, you know, in a, in, and that's different than what's in a driver. I mean, if you think about a lot of iron designs now, they're taking the six iron design and applying it all the way up through the gap wedge. And what doesn't, what people don't think about is your gap wedge is further from your six iron in loft than your driver is. Nobody ever said, I love my six iron. Can you make me a driver like that? And to your point, about these tour players, they're even changing the head design down to the, the four iron and three iron, and then they got a fairway wood, maybe a hybrid, and then they go to the driver. So from the six iron to the driver, you've got three or four distinctly different club head designs, but from the six iron to the highest lofted wedge, you may have two different designs. It makes no sense. I mean, golf clubs are pretty simple devices. You the loft and the weighting and the shaft length, and what are you trying to get that shot to do? So. On the long end of the set, I want high launch and low spin. On the short end of the set, I want low launch and high spin. But I've got more loft, and I'm trying to get lower launch. So it's a challenge. But we've done this with the Edison wedges, and we, we feel like we've really addressed wedges as a category by themselves. And they're not an extension of irons, and they're not something the tour player plays. Do you think that you Bob Oakey and Roger Cleveland are analyzing your wedges and probably adding? starting to add maybe another line or trying to kind of copy what you're doing? Because it only makes well, sense. Most, most well, golfers out there are amateurs. I can tell you this. Nobody in the category is making, everybody in the category is making the top part of their wedges thicker than they did 10, 15 years ago. Everybody. None of them are as thick as my Reed Lockhart wedges were in 1990s. Okay? Because their tour players are going to hold them back. Now, Callaway is just with their new Opus wedge. They've kind of been the first one to say, here's the Opus for the tour player, and here's the Opus Platinum for the rest of you. And they talk about putting 17 grams of tungsten in the top line. 17 grams of tungsten replaces about 8 grams or 7 grams of steel. So you only had an 8 gram real change in weight, but it's all the way up at the top. And you still have no mass behind that center face hit because it's above the thick part of the bottom. It's below that little eight grams. Our, our club head, when we've dissected our club head at the fifth groove, the top half of our club head weighs 35 to 40 grams more than any other wedge on the market. And that's a lot of mass. Um, and that mass makes a difference. You know, and, and we we're challenging some big brands. I have great respect for Bob Bokey and Aaron Dill at Titleist and Roger Cleveland, I've known since he was in the persimmon wood business, brilliant guy. The, the teams at Callaway, Taylor, I mean, they've got tons of R&D and tons of expertise. But as long as you're 
as you're trying to satisfy the tour player, you're not going to be able to meet the needs of the six to 12 to 20 handicap. Different needs. You know, the tour players don't play the same driver that we play. May have the same brand name on it, but they got four different models in that line. And the tour player's playing one. He's playing a totally different shaft than us. And, um, you know, I, I think for recreational golfers, even low single digits, to try to compare your game to a tour player is going to take you down the wrong path, whether it's iron, shafts, golf ball, drivers. You cannot optimize the golf club the way a tour player can. Again, these are the top 200 guys in the world, you know, out of 50 million golfers. You're not the, the best club champion in America could not win on the on the Corn Ferry Tour. I mean, it's just a different game these guys play. As you pointed out, trying to fit for balance because you're always facing different lies is ridiculous, but you do have this awesome wedge fit system. And I know when you were fitting me for my wedges, we actually talked on the phone. Can you tell everyone at home how you help get the right wedges in their hands? Well, I've always been a big believer that what you want in your bag is you want your clubs to feel the same. It amazes me how many golfers have different grips on their driver, their fairway wedges, their irons, and their wedges. And you got a different feel in your hands all the time. So I think that you want your clubs to feel the same. And I use the term seamless transition and disconnect. If I get out of the cart and I walk over to my ball, and I know it's going to be either a P-club or a gap wedge. And I call it the P-club because these don't have enough loft to be true wedges anymore. But my P-club was custom fit. It's got a 70-gram R-flex graphite shaft in it with this kind of a grip. In my gap wedge, I bought off the rack. It's got a 130-gram stiff steel shaft in it. There's a 70, 80, 50 gram disconnect between these two golf clubs. I cannot make the same golf swing. You know, it'd be like if you put four different tires on your car. I mean, it's not going to handle properly. But, you know, you have to have the consistency of feel, the consistency of weight, balance. Um, and I'm a big believer in graphite shafts and wedges because a lot of us are playing graphite in our irons. Um, get the grip sizes the same. I do believe wedge grips, you know, it feels better sometime to put a little extra tape under the right hand because you're gripping down on that glove a lot. But the wedge fit exercise was created to not just say, what wedges do you want? But tell us about your game. How far do you hit a nine iron? You know, where you custom fit? What are your specs? Um, you know, do you hit the ball too high, too low about right? What kind of sand do you play? What kind of fairways do you play? Because the more we know, the better we can say, here's the Edison wedge is going to optimize your game. And, and we love talking to people. We've got really good people on the phone, PGA professionals. You know, if you go through your wedge fit and go, hey, I have a question, man, by all means, pick up the phone and call us. I mean, we're a, a niche brand. We're a custom shop. We don't have any stock wedges. We don't sell anything off the rack. And the better we know you, the better wedges we're going to deliver for you. This might be a Texas thing, but you offer a no-risk trial, so you're really standing behind these wedges. Well, we're we're different. You know, our wedges look different than anybody else's. And, you know, but that's the history of golf clubs. You know, the ping answer didn't look like a bullseye. And the ping eye didn't look like a McGregor blade. And Big Bertha sir, and TaylorMade Metalwood didn't look like your persimmon. And Big Bertha didn't look like your TaylorMade. And Great Big Bertha didn't look like that. And so, you know, these big mallet putters that have taken over the door, they don't look like a ping answer. So if you want different results, you're going to have to see something different. I mean, I can't. You know, it's the old insanity about doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. If you want different results, you got to have a different look, particularly in a golf club that's a piece of molded metal. And so we know this looks different, but we know it works better. It works different. And we're a challenger brand. I mean, people can buy a big brand and they have the confidence because that's what they've always played. They don't, they don't get better. So we know the only way to, to really evaluate a wedge is put it in play not on the range. You need to go out on your golf course and hit the shots you face through a round of golf. And that's what we offer our 100% risk-free trial. We want to put it in your bag, put it in your hands, take you a round or two, a few shots to figure out, hey, this flies a little different, handles a little different. You know, I didn't get a bunker shot my first round. Well, I need to get another round. I need to hit a bunker shot. So we know if you give us a fair trial, you're going to see this is really something different. Um, I had one customer early on said, you've done the wedges what Big Bertha did to drivers. Big Bertha revolutionized drivers, you know, what, 35 years ago now? Um, and maybe we have revolutionized wedges. I would tell you, we got a lot of owners will tell you we certainly have. Um, 
but you know, it's people up to now have always said, well, I just pick wedges. This, I like this brand. Maybe that shape looks a little better. That's not what it's about. It's about what is the golf ball doing? That's all that matters. Nobody bought a metal wood because it looked prettier than a persimmon. It's like I'm a machine. I demoed them yesterday. They were so good and easy to hit. I started getting cocky on video and calling my shots. 30 yards, 50 yards, 60 yards. I don't know what was going on there because to me, wedge, wedge shots are maybe the hardest part of the game to consistently get right because you're always trying to dial it up a little bit or dial it back. Now, I've got three of these babies and you know I like them. As I told you, I want them all the same size. It's a little bit of the whole Bryson DeChambeau thing. It's my own, my own like theory that I don't need to go up a half inch, you know, for each club, but you've mastered like not just the function, but the form. As I pulled these out of the boxes, it's literally like, wow, these are amazing looking as good. I've never seen a better looking wedge. I'll put it that way. Well, thank you. Cause I, and I do believe golf clubs have to be aesthetically pleasing. You are watching this in real time, how easy these wedges are to hit. There's no question wedge play is the hardest part of the game. And, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is because with all the loft on a wedge, everything is a glancing blow. You know, whereas a seven iron at 28, 30 degrees is a pretty direct blow. A driver is a very direct blow and it's sitting up on a tee. So you have the same lie every time on a driver. But a wedge, because it's a glancing blow, uh, that's a more difficult thing to handle because there's some slippage in that face. Because it's the shortest golf club, it's got the stiffest shaft. There's a little less room for you to make a mistake there. And, and people don't practice. You know, we swing our driver kind of one way. We swing our five iron kind of one way, our eight iron kind of one way. Maybe we grip down to take a few yards off, but we pretty much make the same swing. Whereas in a course or a round of golf, I may make five or six completely different swings with my gap wedge or my sand wedge. There's a lot of I think misperception about grooves on the golf club and what they really can do. Grooves are on the face of the golf club primarily to channel away moisture and dirt and grass so that you can get more ball on the face of the club to improve your coefficient of friction. So if if you had a wet club face with no grooves, the ball's gonna slide up that face. That's just what would happen. If you know, would you have tread on the tires on your car because it has to handle a variety of conditions. But if you go to Indy cars on a dry track, they're running slicks because they want maximum amount of rubber on the on the, the track. But if you get some moisture interjected, then they have to put tires on their car that has some tread on them so you can get rubber, you know, on the track and you know, on hydroplane. That's what happens with a with a golf ball on the face of a golf club. The grooves don't create all the spin. We did some testing with our club head on a dry golf ball and one club head, it was Edison 57 degree wedges. One club head we took, you know, we made it without any grooves or face texture at all. It was just machine smooth. The other one was our production wedge with the grooves and the X pattern. The only difference in spin was 15% on a dry ball. Our, our wedge without any grooves at all spun more than main tour blade wedges that are right off the production line. Now, when you interject moisture and grass and things, that smooth face flat doesn't work. I mean, the ball knuckleballs and goes everywhere. But but what grooves are there for is to channel away material. The USGA changed the rules on grooves in 2010, almost 15 years ago. We can't do anything to a groove today by the rules of golf that we couldn't do 15 years ago. Nobody's got a secret sauce for grooves. What we have been able to do is hold machining tolerances a little bit tighter, a little bit tighter, a little bit tighter. And so we can improve the groove efficiency 3%, 5%, 8%. That doesn't improve spin by 8%. That improves the groove efficiency by that. Spin is a combination of quality of contact, cleanliness of contact, and the coefficient of friction. But it's mainly influenced by where the club head is. I mean, and I mean the design of the club head. Where is the mass? If the mass is above the point of impact, go back to the gear effect thing. If the mass is above the point of impact, the ball's going to launch lower with more spin. The driver doesn't matter if they put grooves on the driver or not. It's not going to spin the ball because all the mass is below the point of impact. And the sweet spot in most drivers is just a little bit high and toward the toe because you're getting more mass below that point of impact. 
So, you know, our golf club head is designed to deliver a gear effect, smash factor, and that's going to give you more spin. But we use a progressive groove. I would, I do in the higher loss, try to get the grooves closer together. You maybe put one more groove on that ball just to increase that coefficient of friction ever so slightly. We put the X pattern in the face on the higher loss because that's where the ball is more likely to try to slide up the face. So again, whatever I can do within the rules of golf to put a little more texture in there, but nobody's got a secret sauce. And I always reduce the the wedge category to, it's a story of grooves and grinds. And if you look at every other company out there, they're talking about how many grinds they have and what they've done with their grooves. And they're ignoring the fact that their club head is not designed from scratch to give you forgiveness, consistent smash factor, and optimized gear effect. Clubhead wasn't designed to do that. Clubhead was designed to satisfy the tour player. You've designed the Edison wedges from scratch, and another person who designed something from scratch was Thomas Edison and the light bulb. Can you tell us about the name of Edison wedges? I love the story. Well, yeah, it was kind of funny. We so when I had this inspiration and really prompted by a good friend saying, you know, we really need to start a wedge company and let you do your work without worrying about, hey, it's the Ben Hogan brand. I have to be respectful. You know, it's like, let's just go do wedges the way you've always wanted to do them. And so it came around in this conversation. We're like, well, what do you want to do, Terry? And I said, you know, golfers, regardless of handicap, regardless of skill, every golfer has the same goal. I want to hit better golf shots more frequently. That's what I want, whether I'm Scotty Scheffler or a 28 handicapper. I want to hit better golf shots more often. So I said, our company's going to be all about better golf shots. And how are we going to get there? We're going to get there by getting outside the box. We're going to, we can't be held back by what wedges should look like. So we're going to have fresh ideas about wedges, and, and that kind of became bold ideas. So bold ideas and better golf shots. When we talk about ideas, the light bulb comes to mind. It's kind of the universal symbol of an idea. And one of my very close friends is an engineer. And Thomas Edison is like one of his heroes, like Ben Hogan was mine. And he said, you know, Terry, you've been relentless in this pursuit for over 30 years. Thomas Edison was relentless in this idea of the incandescent bulb. Thomas Edison actually had 1,083 patents to his name more than anybody in history until the recent tech revolution. And so it kind of the light bulb and Edison and the ideas, it's like, hey, nobody has ever, you know, there's no Edison. I didn't really want to put my name on a golf company. I mean, I like having my name on the club as the designer. I wish I'd have been doing that my whole life. More people would know who I am. But we just really like the name Edison. It's got an nice little ring and, and um, you know, it's and so we chose that as a name, secured the trademark for the golf category and and off we went. Are there any plans for you, because you've also made putters in the past, to go outside of just being the wedge guy and being the iron and putter guy and just taking over more different markets? Because I feel there's potentially ways that you can also revolutionize those fields as well. You know, I, I'm thinking about that kind of stuff all the time. In fact, I've uh, just put a putter back in my bag that was actually part of the putter line I designed for for Hogan in the early 90s. It's one of my favorite designs. It's a little kind of a techie takeoff on a bullseye. And it's just the cleanest looking little blade, but it's not, you know, a forgiving big super mallet. I still play the Fort Worth. I still play the Fort Worth blade irons because I like what that golf club does. That golf club lets me shape the ball the way I want. I'm very blessed at 72 years old. I've kept my golf skills up. My strength is a little less than it was, you know, 30 years ago, but I like to shape the golf ball. I play in 20 mile hour winds all the time down here on the Texas coast. And I want to be able to flight the ball and shape it. And I have ideas about irons, but there's so much to do in the wedge category that we, we haven't done. And I'm encouraged at one side to, Hey, what if we became like the penultimate wedge company? We do more with wedges for more different golfer profiles than anybody. Uh, certainly a lot of opportunity there. Um, you know, my, my rebel creative streak always also has me over here in irons. But one of the things I, I think about irons is that, you know, what makes a good 25 degree iron, whether it's got a five or a six or a four on the bottom doesn't matter, but it's a 25 degree iron. That's a different golf club than a good 35 degree golf club. And that's a different club than a good 45 degree golf club. And that's a different golf club than a good 55. And so, as I mentioned a while ago, your six iron is closer to your driver than it is to your gap wedge. So 
this idea of match sets of irons really is kind of a, a an arcane, obsolete concept, actually, because of the truth of that. And then you get into, I call it the P club. When I was playing golf as a teenager and young adult, my P club was a 51 degree golf club. I could pitch the golf ball with that club. As it migrated down to 48 and then 46, and now some of them are in the low 40s, it's not a wedge any longer. It's an eight iron with a P on the bottom. It's got, you know, 39 to 42 degrees aloft. You can't hit a pitch shot with it. I had a, a friend of mine at the close, a good example that I keep watching him hit these pitch shots and he's, you know, he flies it where he wants, but the ball's rolling across the green. I finally, I said, Rick, what are you pitching the ball with? He goes, I'm my pitching wedge. I said, well, your pitching wedge is your old eight or nine iron. Try pitching with your gap wedge now because that's a true wedge. And all of a sudden he's hitting the ball up with spin. And he goes, wow, I didn't know that. And people don't think about that, that it's, it's your number 10 iron anymore. It's not really a wedge. And you need to have that club in the 49 to 51 degree range. You need to have that club in the 53 to 55. You need to have that club 57 to 60. I think anybody over a one handicap shouldn't carry anything over a 59 or 60 degree. It's just too hard to handle because the ball with that much loft, I mean, it's really hard to make crisp, you know, contact with the golf ball. But, you know, irons, putters, I'm always thinking about different things, but the driver wood market, that's gone into total rocket science with all the multi-materials. More of that's coming into irons. And as I mentioned, I think a good 26 or 24, 23 degree iron, is a totally different animal than a good 37 to 41 degree iron. So who knows where we'll go? And and then what is a wedge anyway? I mean, is it defined by loft, by looks? You know, I mean, is, can a 40-degree golf club really be a wedge or is it a scoring club? What is it, you know? Ben Crenshaw, Tom Kite, Justin Leonard, Paul Lazinger. Which of these four guys that you've worked with was the best wedge player? Well, you know, Tom Kite, I think it's different. Tom Kite, and these are the old school guys. And I think the old school guys did not have the vast array of skills around the greens that the modern players have because they didn't have to, to play the courses they played. Tom Kite was absolute dart thrower with his 60 degree wedge. He could hit it in the hula hoop over and over and over from 63 yards, I think was his magic number. I didn't really spend that much time with Justin Leonard. I was able to spend time with Tom watching this magical stuff. Ben had, to me, of all the golfers I've known, more feel versatility to do different things with a wedge in his hand. We were out uh, when he was working with us at Reed Lockhart. We were out at his course in Austin, and he was hitting wedge. And, and this is when machine grooves, go back to the grooves a minute, this is when CNC milled grooves were just coming about. And Ben made the comment to me that as an amateur golfer, it just blew me away. He said, Terry, I don't want the wedge to spin the ball. I'll spin the ball. Now, most of us can't relate to that. But I said, what do you mean, Ben? And we're out about 75 yards off the green, and it's a – that particular hole, the green is flush to the, you know, it's kind of a hole designed to be able to run the ball up. Uh, it's not elevated at all, no bunkers in front. And Ben throws down four or five balls and hits four or five completely different shots from 75 yards, all within an eight or nine foot circle around the flag. And he hits a high soft shot that lands like a butterfly with sore feet. He hits a one hop and stop. He hits one in behind the hole and backs it up. And then the one that blew me away the most, he's got a 56-degree sand wedge in his hand, and he hits a bump and run that lands 10, 15 yards short of the green, releases and runs 45 feet back to the flag with the sand wedge. I'm sitting there going, how the heck do you do that? That is absolute control of the golf ball with that wedge in his hand. And so I would say from an artistry standpoint, Ben constantly amazed me with his feel and touch and imagination. You know, again, this is you know, mid nineties, you know, Ben's in his forties like me at that time. He's only a year different than me in age, but his artistry and the feel that he exhibited and Tom is more mechanical. I mean, and I, you know, he's just machine-like. You know, um, so the, to me, those two guys, they grew up together. They both had Harvey Finnick as a teacher and they're two totally different golfer profiles and both, you know, outstanding in their, in their professional achievements. Thank you so much for being on this episode of Big Boy Pants Golf. Folks at home, check out the wedges, check out the website. They're magic. Well, I appreciate that. It was a lot of fun. And as you can tell, when you get talking about wedges and golf, I can go on and on. And it's always great to to uh, have an opportunity with somebody intelligent like you that can ask good questions and, and help people learn more about what really makes a wedge work. 
So I appreciate it. And anytime, love to come back on and uh, keep me posted on your progress with those wedges. These wedges are awesome.